numbers and stuff. Somebody asked me recently why I was an English major in college and then became a financial planner. Like, what do those have to do with anything at all? Actually, what's funny is if you look at a lot of the great money managers out there, they were English majors. And a professor of mine told me, he said, English is the best degree because you're learning from the smartest people of all time. And then I realized he kind of had an agenda, of course, English professor, job security, wants to keep that paycheck rolling in. But I tend to agree with him. English major, think it's great. But it wasn't about that at first. It was really about, like a lot of kids, numbers came a little more difficult than language did. Words, shaka shocks, even though I'm a stutterer, words came a ton easier. I was in trouble because of words all the time in school. So imagine my surprise when I realized much, much later in life that numbers are actually a blast. Numbers tell some fantastic stories that you can't get with words. And they're stories in a language that a lot of people don't know. Like you're part of this cool club of people that get this whole different story out of things. But the cool thing, and maybe something that some people want to keep a secret, but we certainly don't because we have fun with numbers here, is that the stories that come from numbers and learning about numbers actually not that hard. Live from the three-room apartment above Uncle Jack's garage. Hey there, I'm Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Welcome to Money in the Morning, kids. It's the place where we take not one, but two headlines ripped from the financial press. And today we've got two dandies for you, as mom says. We take them, we not only read them, but we also talk about what they might mean to your wallet. What do all these terms mean? We kind of nerd out on having some fun with numbers and stuff. Not only do we do that, at the end of the show, we put them together in this big idea called the big idea that you can take home and use it for the rest of your day. And that's the genius behind Money in the Morning. Money in the Morning is brought to you by Hurdler. Think about like a high school hurdler, like on the track team, but without the last E. Hurdler is the way to automatically track all your mileage, expenses, income streams, and tax deductions in real time. Get this, on average, people find over 5,600 in tax deductions. So whether you're somebody already in business or somebody that says, you know what, I'm starting this side gig, I'm going to get it started, and then I'm going to get organized, don't do it that way. Be organized from the very beginning. The people helping you with your money will thank you. Your CPA will thank you. We do this in front of a live audience. My friend Deanna, who's here hanging out with us, she's a CPA. She will thank you. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash hurdler, H-U-R-D-L-R. Just get rid of that last E and you've got hurdler. Not only can you try it for free, but if you use our link, you can try the premium product for free. Good stuff there. We've got fantastic stuff today. Numbers and stuff in the headlines. Federal Reserve gold. So Laura, why don't you kick this thing into high gear for us? Who needs coffee when you have money in the morning headlines? And our first headline comes to us from WSJ.com, the Wall Street Journal. It's written by Nick Timoros. Uh, Fed holds rates steady, signals more rate increases ahead. Central Bank offers a mostly upbeat assessment of the economy. Uh, The Federal Reserve held short-term interest rates steady last week and offered a mostly upbeat assessment of the U.S. economy, suggesting another rate increase is likely by year-end. The Fed repeatedly emphasized the economy's strength in a statement released after its two-day policy meeting. It offered nothing to dispel market expectations that it would deliver its fourth rate increase in December. Data released since officials last met in September indicate, quote, that the labor market has continued to strengthen and that economic activity has been rising at a strong rate, the Fed said. The only significant change to the statement nodded to a recent pullback in business investment from its rapid pace earlier this year. Officials voted unanimously in September to raise their benchmark rate to a range between 2% and 2.25%. On Thursday, they voted to leave it unchanged again with no dissents. 
The economy expanded at 3.5% annual rate in the third quarter after a 4.2% pace in the second quarter, the Commerce Department reported. That's roughly double the growth rate Fed officials believe can be sustained over the long run unless the supply of workers or their productivity increases even more rapidly. Meanwhile, the employment rate held at 3.7% in October, a nearly half-century low, and average hourly wages rose 3.1%. Federal Reserve in the news. So let's talk about this. What the heck does that, does that mean? What does, it, what does it mean that the, the, the Fed may... Why would the Fed raise interest rates? If things are going well, so the Fed continually says things are going well, why would we raise interest rates then, Joe? Things are going well. Well, here's, here's the way that it works. There's things going well for the economy and there's things going too well. And what the Fed's trying to do is slow down this specter. The thing that's, that, that kills economies is inflation. And you'll see countries where it gets so bad that they have to devalue their currency. Devaluing your currency is ugly. Imagine if you've got a $10 bill in your pocket and that on Monday and on Tuesday, they say, yeah, we're going to make every $10 bill worth only a dollar. Bam. Ouch. It gets, it gets uh, tough. So to, to fight against inflationary forces and to make sure that the money is worth something that's in your pocket, the Federal Reserve's job is to monitor that. So when we talk about the economy going well, we talk about people having jobs, we talk about wage growth, we talk about all of these cool things, the Federal Reserve puts some heat on it by raising rates. Now, the Federal Reserve doesn't control the rate at your bank. This is actually kind of neat the way that it works. The Federal Reserve controls one little tiny rate, just this little tiny biscuit, this little thin mint of a rate. That rate is a called the Fed Fuds rate is a very short term rate that banks use to borrow money for very short periods of time, money going back and forth very quickly. That's the Fed funds rate. But that's the base rate that all of these banks use. And when they raise the rate on the Fed funds rate, banks pass that on to you. So go thank your bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whoever. I mentioned them because I'm sure they're the first ones to do it. Uh, I don't know who does it first, but uh, we seem to talk about them a lot lately, not doing fantastic stuff for their customer. But... Maybe they are the last ones to do it. I don't know. What I do know is this. They always pass it on to you. It's almost like, you know how gas prices, when you hear about uh, crude oil, almost did a a headline today about crude, decide to talk about gold. We're going to get to gold next. That's always fun. Love talking about gold. Yeah, no. But, but. Uh, crude prices. When, when notice when you hear on the radio that, that the price of crude goes through the roof, all of a sudden it's your local gas station. It jets up. But when you hear that it's going down, very slow to come down. Works very similarly, I think, with the Fed. So, in fact, Bank of America reported that they weren't paying very high interest rates because nobody was demanding it. Um, but they are demanding that they get more of your money if you're going to uh, be using some of their money. Let's talk about that, though. When the Fed raises rates, what does that mean for your money? So that's why it happens. What does it actually mean? It means that if you have revolving debt, revolving debt is tied very closely to the Fed funds rate. So you know if you're thinking about a car loan, If you have credit cards that are a variable interest rate, those are going to move whenever the Fed says they're raising interest rates. So great reason, great reason to pay down any of your debt is just to get out of debt. But when you hear that the Fed is in the mood to keep raising interest rates at least one more time this year, maybe you fast track that. Mortgages, a little bit different. Mortgages are actually tied to T-bills. Uh, And the thing about treasuries, and those are bonds that the government offers, right? The government lives on loans. And so, whole nother story there. But the government lives on loans. There are these bonds you can buy. And when you buy those bonds, you actually get a rate that's based on on those, those, uh, those interest rates. 
Those interest rates, by the way, also going up, not directly tied, but it's like a second domino. You know, you got the series of dominoes. Domino one would be car loans, credit cards, revolving debt. Second domino is going to be that makes bonds change as bond rates change, mortgage rates change. So if you're going to refinance your house, probably a good idea to get on that too, even though there's not a direct correlation between the two. Tough stuff there. Uh, I think that's our, that's our first lesson of the day is if you're going to refinance, get on it. I think the, the, I think there's a bigger lesson there. Just, I don't like somebody else in charge of my debt. I don't like the fact that somebody in Washington had a meeting and that's going to determine what happens with my debt in the future. Very difficult when somebody is on the other end of that chain. I remember those days when I was living paycheck to paycheck and had tons of debt. And it's so frustrating when somebody decides, no, 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 I need to be paid now. No, I know what your priorities are. I know you have a plan for this. I have a different plan, Joe. And my plan is, is that you're going to do it this way. And you can't say no. Very frustrating. So the quicker you get out of debt, the better, especially now with the Fed raising interest rates. That's what that means. Uh, let's say hi to everybody hanging out with us on uh, Facebook. We had some fun problems today getting this little train started and uh, everybody hanging out in the audience helped me solve it. Our live Facebook audience. If you want to be part of our Facebook audience, it's facebook.com forward slash I stack Benjamins and you too can hang out with us while we record these live. Uh, Gregory says, I'm curious if there's lots of English majors. See, that was live too. Uh, he says he's curious if there's English majors at the many English majors, the Citadel, uh, there, there are English majors at the Citadel. There's some, it's not what they're known for. They're known for engineering. Um, and if Lori is, Lori's not here, at least she hasn't said hi yet, but, uh, Lori works at the Citadel and, um, she will testify that fantastic with engineers, not known for their English majors. I'll tell you what they are known for, though. Their pre-law program, and English is a part of their pre-law program. And at the time, I was in English pre-law. When I switched to Michigan State um, halfway through college, I actually uh, switched over to be uh, more on the creative writing train. I thought I was going to be a professor of English. And uh, you see where that ended up. I end up in a three-room apartment above Uncle Jack's garage, living the dream. Deanna's here. She says, we don't want a runaway train. Right. Absolutely. When it comes to inflation, uh, definitely don't want that. Kimberly's here. Kimberly says, Venezuela knows a little about inflation. Yes, they do. <laughs> don't they? That is, if you don't know what's going on in, uh, in Venezuela, look that up. It is, uh, oh, oh, not good. In Zimbabwe, Paul's here. Hey, Paul. Paul says, in Zimbabwe, price of bread changed. By the time you got to the register, the value of your money changed, hyperinflation. I can't imagine that. Oh, the price tag says X. Yeah, that's not the price anymore. There's a new price. And it's not that they really changed the price. It's that they're just trying to keep the price the same. And so they got to charge more depending on how long it stays in your basket. Or as they say here in the South, you're buggy. I've lived here for 10 years in Texarkana. I still haven't gotten used to the phrase, you're buggy, when I go grocery shopping. Somebody said something about my buggy. I'm like, but, but, my Volkswagen? Like, what do you know? My buggy. I like the term buggy. Just just not my thing. Uh, John says, you're a member of the Society of Professional English Majors. Are you talking about the group that we're all, that are all um, uh, uh, Starbucks baristas part-time still in school? No. That's why I switched up. Switched out. Got crazy on them. Went into finance. And I don't know if you've You've, uh, and I don't want to bore people with my story here. You can hear that many other places. But the, uh, uh, a friend of mine said to me about this financial company, he said, we don't normally hire people like you, but I think you'd be good at this when I started working in finance. We don't normally hire people like you, but I think you'd be good at this. It was, that was the start of my uh, move over to finance. Kimberly says, you're technically moving on up if you're above a garage. I am. If I can find a room that's on the third story, 
that will be fantastic. And Deanna is in Arkansas. She says, I thought it was your cart. That's what we always called it a cart, but people around here call it your buggy. I don't know what the deal is with, with uh, your buggy. We'll save that for another show. Let's get on to our second headline, which comes to us from, from Market Watch. And this is written by Rachel Coning Beals. Gold lower heads toward weekly loss as dollar holds on to a post Fed advance. Excitement ensues, I'm sure. When you heard that we were going to talk about the Fed, I know you definitely wanted to turn in, but when we said the Fed and gold, pinch yourself. Let's talk about gold. Precious, oh, and it's also written, I'm sorry, by Myra uh, Safong. I didn't see Myra up there. Precious metals prices drop Friday, headed for a weekly loss, nicked by a firmer dollar that's being bolstered by the Federal Reserve's adherence to an interest rate tightening cycle. Sharp losses for stocks for the session, which are partly tracking the plunge into a bear market for oil, could limit gold's downside should a risk-off sentiment generate refreshed interest in the haven metal. For now, however, gold continues to decline, quote, weighted on by returning risk appetite earlier in the week and the dollar over the last 48 hours with the Fed giving it an extra kick higher said Craig Erlem, senior market analyst at Oanda, in a daily update. This decline in gold is very gradual, though, which suggests to me a certain resilience in gold bulls. And if the dollar fails to build on these gains, which I suspect it might, they may feel emboldened going into year end. Uh, December gold uh, futures lost 14 bucks. Uh, uh, trading down 1.8% for the week. December's uh, silver futures dropped 30.3 cents or 2.1% and has fallen more than 4% for the week. Gold suffered a fourth loss in five sessions on Thursday, then struggled for direction in electronic trading with the U.S. dollar extending gains once the latest policy update from the Federal Reserve signals a central bank still on a tightening course for later this year and early next I'm going to skip the next couple headlines because it talks more about the dollar. I'm not that interested in the dollar. I will link to this piece on my Twitter feed if you're interested in reading about the dollar. But uh, I want to go back to what Mr. Hayworth says here. Quote, we maintain a cautious view on gold, believing trends of higher interest rates, both real and nominal, and a stronger U.S. dollar are meaningful headwinds into 2019. And then it goes into other metals training. Metals. Gold. Let's talk about gold. What do I make about the fact that gold prices are down? Isn't it interesting that uh, gold prices down and it's because the economy seems strong. Gold prices being down right now, I think over the short term has a lot to do with the fact that after the midterms, we see, and we reported on this earlier, that after the midterms, uh, the market usually goes up. And because of that, the, the people that need that safe haven of gold Maybe feeling the pinch. The funny thing is, though, look at all the flailing when it comes to all the stuff I just read about gold. It could be because of, we're talking about the dollar. We're talking about the Fed. We're talking about the stock market. We're talking about all these reasons. You don't want to talk about so many reasons with gold. It's because of the fact that gold is eight times, eight times more volatile than stocks. And I'm not talking about over long periods of time. I'm just talking about just the general up and down on your daily day. Eight times more volatile than stocks. And yet, there are people out there who go to gold. And you know why? Because that stock market's too risky. Eight times the volatility in gold. So if you think the stock market's risky, yeah, eight times more. Not that great. I'm not a, a and, and by the way, it's not that I hate gold. Let me tell you the way that we would use gold in portfolios. Gold, it's really neat. Gold, when you track it backwards over long periods of time, gold is like pepper in a portfolio. You can really slow down the volatility of your portfolio and not affect the upwardness of gold as long as you use just a little pinch. So between three and 5% of your portfolio in gold can be fantastic for your portfolio. Now, I don't like just going with gold. You know, here they talk about copper, palladium. I skipped that part of the piece. I did mention silver. You could even go as far as just natural resources in general, and you'll get a lot of the same. But I really like this idea of a pinch of commodities goes a long way, like in a soup, you know? 
if if you just dunk a bunch of pepper in it, you ruin the soup. But just a little bit over long periods of time, fantastic. The bad news about gold over short periods of time, it will flail around. But over the course of a week, course of a month, course of a year, it will do nothing. It'll do zero. But then over the course of three months, it'll skyrocket like nobody's business. So if you look at gold on average over really long periods of time, return, depending on when you look, not that bad. It's hard to look at a period of time for gold because it seriously depends on when you look and the last time that went through the roof. So I look at gold like the lottery. So when you tell me that gold is really safe and the stock market isn't, I think you're telling me the lottery's safe and stocks aren't. And then I know that you don't know how stocks work because stocks are not voodoo. It's an indicator of the economy. And if you believe the economy is going to continue, it's going to continue on the backs of these companies. And if these companies are going to continue, the owners of those companies need to get paid. And if it's a public company, the way they get paid is the stock price going up, number one. And number two is dividends. Those are the two ways. Good stuff. Let's say hi to our friends uh, hanging out on Facebook. Deanna says exactly when it comes to volatility. She says they think it's safer because they can hold it. Yes, Len Penzo thinks it's safer because he can hold it. My question, what, what is go, what, let's go to the apocalypse thing. I'm not beyond talking about the apocalypse. We can do that here, can't we? This is our safe place. Let's talk apocalypse for a second. How, how, how worthwhile is your gold in, a, in an apocalyptic situation? I think I'd rather have guns and food. Like that's what I, that's what I think I'd rather have. Uh, yeah, you can, I mean, I got this bar of stuff. I mean, maybe that becomes what we trade, but think about what would have to happen to have us go from trading money to trading gold. Some people can imagine that. Not me. Mike's here. Hey, Mike, Mike said, Mike and I are hanging out later and there may be a margarita involved. Just saying. Mike says, are there any commodities less volatile than stocks? Would you ever use other commodities than precious metals in a portfolio? Uh, yes, I like. So I like. It, it, it all depends on the time frame. So a couple plays that I've liked in the past. Believe it or not, the Austrian, this is so funny, the Austrian index uh, gets you into Eastern Europe, a lot of, a lot of uh, natural resources, and still has ties to the West, and there's also a lot of timber involved. On that note, timber, natural resources, Canada, also a diversifier. I don't know that you need to go that way, though, Mike. I think you can do. I think you can do gold or commodities that are more risky, um, and put that in a portfolio. But because it's buoyed by the rest of the portfolio, when it doesn't do well. I think you actually come out ahead. So, and I and, and I know I've said this in the past that if you take the S and P five hundred, or let's take let's take Blogger does your thing here. I'm about to make a lot of people mad, but uh, VTSAX. Let's take that the total stock market index, and let's instead add some more aggressive stuff to that. Right? You think you're making the portfolio more aggressive? You're actually not. By adding some of these different risks like emerging markets, international developed markets, commodities to it, which are all riskier than your VTSAX, you actually calm down the portfolio. And once again, over long periods of time, you're getting closer to what's called the efficient frontier. Not as easy for people to understand, but a better game, I think, than just playing the total market index. The uh, John's here. He says, wait, did you just say that like Pepper, we should play the lottery with 3 to 5% of our portfolio? I meant if you're that person, no, no, no. Nice job. Uh, John is very A plus B equals C. Uh, in this case, yeah. I definitely, I think I did say that, but that's definitely not what I meant. What I meant was, was that use it sparingly and it's going to be great. Use it for all your portfolio. It's like playing the lottery. It's safer than the lottery. You actually will have some, have some money there at the end. Uh, Kimberly's here. Kimberly said, in an apocalypse, gold and metals can at least be good conductors. I know a joke about that. 
I don't have time to tell it, but John would appreciate the joke. John is our resident joke teller in our basement Facebook group, and he's awesome at it. Gregory is here. Hey, Gregory. Gregory says there's a few interesting commodity funds out there. The big distinction seems to be whether or not they include energy commodities or not. If I remember right, there's one out there that's an ETM backed by the Swedish government. You know, it's it's actually funny. Those those Nordic uh, exchanges, too, are a place uh, to get lots of commodities. So if you just buy Nordic exchanges, you're going to get a heavy commodities. Um, once again, like timber um, and fuels, you're going to get a lot of those those involved. Um and see, it's funny. So you can play this many, many different ways. But I like having metals involved. I actually personally like silver a little better because I can understand why people use it. Gold, it all depends on jewelry um, and, and, and people wondering what's going to happen with the market tomorrow. It's a, it can be a nasty place. Mike's here. Hey, Mike. Mike said, could real estate take the place of commodities here? Would like to learn more about REITs versus crowdsource platforms like Fundra. Mike, you are too funny. Mike brings up the one company that I've complained about in the past. So uh, lots of other companies out there, Mike. But here's to Mike's point, real estate doesn't take the place of commodities. Real estate over long periods of time takes the place of stocks. Real estate and stocks are the two places historically that have kicked inflation's butt over a long period of time. Not that, not that risky, uh, especially in something like a REIT. So when you look at the North American real estate index, the, the, the return somewhere just around 10% over long periods, same for the stock market historically. And in both cases, uh, most financial planners will tell you to look to seven to 8% is where you should be when you think about where you want to be in the future. Real estate and stocks. Now, decide which one you like better. Go lead with that one and then have the other one still in your portfolio as a diversifier because both of them have significant downsides. Real estate tends to move a little more slowly up and down. So it gives you the illusion of more safety than stocks. And at a time like Brexit, as an example, a couple of years ago, remember that? Market, stock market goes through the floor. Real estate just kept on keeping on. So if you were in the middle of a housing transaction during Brexit, not a big change to your price. Much, much slower up and down. The bad news about real estate is liquidity. You can't get at it very fast. In a REIT, you can get at it very fast, but in a REIT, you're also sprinkling in the stock market a little bit because REITs will move a little bit like stocks because of the nature of how they trade. But real estate, in, in, interesting point there, Mike, uh, uh, like it. I actually like uh, Fundrise better now that they got the deceptive ever. I, I don't know anything about Fundrise. All I know is Fundrise had incredibly deceptive crap on their front page. And it was funny. I'm not egotistical enough to think that I'm the one that changed it. But I do know that after we complained heavily about it one day on Stacking Benjamins, within a week it was gone. So I'm hoping, but I doubt it. I think they, I think they just did it. Uh, I'm hoping that. I don't really care why they did it. I'm just happy that Fundrise decided to quit deceiving people. Uh, I don't, because of that, I've never learned how it works on the inside. Uh, I've heard good stories from people. Um, but, but that gave me such a bad taste in my mouth. Let's put a better taste in our mouth by getting ready to talk about the big idea. How are we going to put these two together? We have to put together interest rates and gold to give you your big takeaway from this episode. And before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about Hurdler, our sponsor for this episode, because Hurdler is the place I get very frustrated managing the books. I love side hustles, but there's two different disciplines you need. Number one is you need to be passionate about the thing that you're doing and about running a business. And then the second thing you need is the ability to stay organized enough that, that the, the uh, bookkeeping train doesn't wreck things. And if you have great bookkeeping, this is where the numbers get nice. I'm listening to an audio book right now. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to pull this up, uh, called beta ball. 
that I love about the, about the Golden State uh, Warriors and how they used, much like Moneyball, how they use statistics and numbers. If, if you understand your numbers, you're going to make decisions a lot better than if you don't. Hurdler makes that easy for you. Hurdler automatically tracks all of your mileage, expenses, your income streams, your tax deductions in, in, in real time. You know your profit before and after tax. It's built for self-employed people, whether you're a freelancer, a realtor, a, a host driver, a courier. You're doing it part-time, working full-time. You can auto-track your mileage, maximize your profits, track every expense, claim every deduction, and it interfaces with a lot of the software you already use, and you can send things directly to your tax preparer. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash hurdler, H-U-R-D-L-R, and not only can you try it for free, if you use our link, you can kick the tires on the premium version, the version that <laughs> usually the free version on any software, if you're serious about it, is not the version you're going to use. So kick the tires on the premium version by using our link. You're welcome. All right, let's 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 make our big point. And our big point is going to be much more straightforward today than it usually is. A lot of days we're creative, but today, weekend, it's not that creative. Once you know the numbers, you know what these two things say. Whenever you hear somebody on the radio, somebody on television talk about the Federal Reserve, you perk your ears up and here's what you hear. Refinance your house now if they're raising interest rates. Get rid of that car loan. Lock in your interest rates as rates are going up. For your short-term interest rates, also make sure that your money market, your savings account are keeping up with those. You don't have to have 0.1 at your bank. The guys online are paying 2% and they're still FDIC insured. So you want to get on that. On the other side, you hear about gold and precious metals and what precious metals did lately. Ignore it. Ignore it completely. Because gold takes off and does lots of stuff or it does absolutely nothing. Gold over the short term, it does not matter. That whole second headline I read, means nothing. That's your big takeaway. Federal Reserve, listen up and know how to understand between the lines of the numbers they're analyzing. Gold numbers, in my view, they're completely disposable. That's going to do it for today, guys. Thanks a ton for hanging out. Everybody on Facebook, what a chatty crowd we had today. That was fun. And uh, if you are somebody who wants to hang out with us when we do this live in the future, Facebook.com forward slash I stack Benjamins. Speaking of stacking Benjamins, go stack some Benjamins. We'll talk to you next time back here at Money in the Morning. Money in the Morning is created by Joe Saul Cihai and comes to your ears because of the collective genius of our producer, Richie Rutter Reese, engineer, Caden Thompson, and a pack of very well trained ferrets here in the basement. You'll find links to all of our headlines featured on today's show in Joe's Twitter feed at at Average Joe Money. I know you already know this too, but Money in the Morning is for entertainment purposes only. and You shouldn't act on anything recommended by a bunch of entertainers in a basement without first consulting with your financial advisor and second, having your head examined. Have a headline you'd like us to discuss? Send them to Joe at stackingbenjamins.com or put them on our Stacking Benjamins Basement closed Facebook group. This show is copyright 2018, Stacking Benjamins LLC, all rights reserved. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I reserve the right to always say, we'll see you next time back here on Money in the Morning. <laughs>